All right, so just a brief review as to what we've covered so far in this series of making wise decisions. In our first class, we learned that God's revealed will for our lives is found in His Word, the Bible. As for His decreed will for our lives, the things that He has foreordained to happen, He reveals in the course of time through providence. In our second class, we looked at how we are to understand uh, promptings, a sense of being led by the Spirit, and feelings of peace in our decision-making. We saw that these things are unreliable sources and should not be used as the final authority as the will of God for our lives. In the third class, we looked at the place of the conscience in making decisions and how we are to instruct our conscience by the Word of God, or else we could be led astray. Last week, Pastor Joe led us in prioritizing of choices, weighing positive commands, uh, and uh, the process of making the right choice when the Bible doesn't give us clear commands. Today, we will be looking at how to make decisions by God's providential dealings with us in our circumstances, which are often referred to as open and closed doors. We want to answer the following questions. Should circumstances be used authoritatively as the voice of God speaking to us? How do we determine if an open door is God's providential leading or not? How are we to view closed doors when our desires are right and we prayed, but yet the door remains closed? What if, what if we face hardship after we make the decision? Should we interpret that as having made the wrong decision? So we'll begin by looking first at God's providence in the world and in our lives as his people. Now, I like the Westminster description of Providence in chapter 5, section 1 to 7. I have sections 1 to 3 and 7 in your notes. And it says the following concerning Providence. God, the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things, from the greatest even to the least by his most wise and holy providence, according to his infallible foreknowledge, and the free and immutable counsel of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. Although, in relation to the, no the foreknowledge and decree of God, the first cause, all things come to pass immutably and infallibly. Yet, by the same providence, he ordaineth them to fall out according to the nature of second causes, either necessarily, freely, or contingently. God, in his ordinary providence, makes use of means, yet is free to work without, above, and against them at his pleasure. And then section 7. As the providence of God doth in general reach to all creatures, so after a most special manner, it takes care of his church and disposes all things to the good thereof. So God is the first cause of all that happens in the earth, on the earth. He is working in the world, whether directly or through secondary means, to accomplish his decreed will for the glory of his name and for the good of his church. Everything, everything. I was talking to someone yesterday and I mentioned that God is in control. He says, what do you mean God is in control about the virus? He says, God is not, the, he doesn't have anything to do with the evil that the Chinese did and what he said. I said, no, God is in control. He allowed it. He allowed it. He has a purposes that he's accomplishing. And as his children, God has a special care for us. He has loved us from all eternity, 
redeemed us by the precious blood of his son, adopted us into his family, and sealed us with the Holy Spirit as a token and surety of our inheritance. And this verse, brethren, in Luke beautifully shows God's providential care for us as his children. Luke 12, verse 6 and 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. The Lord looks after the sparrows that are sold for pennies, whom he made for a temporary existence. How much more will he take care of us, whom he has purchased with the precious blood of his son and destined for eternity? Throughout scripture, we see the Lord's providence in, in the life of his people. We see this clearly in the book of Ruth and Esther. But in neither of those books do we read that the Lord spoke to them directly regarding or in visions to tell them what to do. But we see his hand at work to lead them in the path that he has foreordained for them. I'll give you all for instance. Ruth chapter 2 verse 3 says, So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was, the, who was of the clan of Elimelech. It almost seemed as if though, by chance, she happened to come to Boaz's field. Well, we know that God from all eternity has foreordained that the Messiah would be born from the line of Boaz. And that Ruth would be in that line. So she didn't just happen to come upon Boaz's field. God foreordained that she should come to Boaz's field. And so, as, as you know the story. The same thing we read in the book of Esther. We find a similar thing. On the very night that Haman built the gallows that he was planning to hang Mordecai on the next day. That it just so happened that the king couldn't sleep. And it just so happened that he wanted the chronicles of the memorable deeds to be read to him. And it just so happened that there was an account of Mordecai finding out about a plot to kill the king. And it was in the chronicles where it was read. And you know the story, how the story unfolds. Haman gets hanged on the gallows that he built for Mordecai. And the Lord spared the Jews from the great slaughter. And instead, they prevailed over their enemies. And Mordecai was elevated to the place of honor by the king. And because this fulfills the decree that God has for his people. He must preserve his people. Why? Because that's where the line of the Messiah would come from. And so they must be preserved. So there's no question that God guides and directs in our lives through providential circumstances. The question we want to answer now is, should circumstances be viewed as God speaking to us and thus be used as an authority in our decision-making process? You get the question? Are you with me? Did I lose you? Are you tracking? All right. If not, just raise your hand and we'll stop and we'll try to get back on track. Listen to uh, uh, Dave Suavely in his book, Decisions, Decisions. He quotes from Haddon Robinson from a section entitled Circumstantial Evidence. This is what he says. He says, many people overemphasize the importance of circumstances in the decision-making process. Although circumstances are a factor in nearly all decisions, it is important that we not let circumstances dictate the decisions you make. Many people consider circumstances to be God's voice. They depend on circumstantial evidence. But circumstances are simply the factors that bring us to the point of decision. They often outline the decision that must be made 
but circumstances are not necessarily signs of God's guidance. What he's saying is that circumstances are one factor among many other factors in the decision-making process. They are not to supersede all other factors like the Word of God, biblical wisdom, godly desires, and godly counsel. When we talk about using circumstances in our decision-making, we refer to them as open and closed doors. Paul uses the term open doors a few times, I think five times, in his writing as he refers to opportunities for the ministry. One of those opportunities, he decides not to walk, even though it was an open door, as he says in 2 Corinthians 2, 12 through 13, he says, When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there, so I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. So how do we evaluate if a particular opportunity seems to be like an open door from the Lord and we should take advantage of it, walk in it as, as we would say? We must always keep in mind that the final authority is the scripture and not our feelings or circumstances. I have listed in, in your outline four questions to evaluate if an open door is God's uh, uh, revealed will for our lives. One, does it contradict clear commands in scripture? We have a clear scriptural example from the life of David at, uh, on, on this point. David was fleeing from Saul and his army of 3,000. David and his men were in a cave. Saul went into the cave by himself to relieve himself, which is a euphemism. Basically, he was going to the bathroom. And we pick up the narrative in 1 Samuel 24, 3 and 4. He says, Now David and his men were sitting in the uh, innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Now, David had been praying. We read in the Psalms, David praying that the Lord would deliver him of his enemies. And we know he spoke of his enemy being the main enemy being Saul. So here's the chance his, his men say to him, David, here is the answer to your prayer, man. This can't get any better. Come on. God brought, the, brought your enemy right into your hand. Get up. Here's your opportunity. Open door all the way. What providential answer to prayer, right? I mean, the circumstances couldn't be any better. Wrong. Let's see what he said. 1 Samuel 24, 4. The then David rose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him. Because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe, he said to, his, to the men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, saying, He is the Lord's anointed. David's heart smote him. Why? Because he touched the Lord's anointed. The Lord had anointed Saul with holy oil. And he will dispose of him in his time. David was not to do it on his own terms. If he had tried to usurp the throne through violence, he would have brought harm to himself and to Israel. There was a similar incident, if you recall, in chapter 26. Saul and his army, again, they were in camp. They were chasing after David. And they, it was at night, and they were asleep. And David and Abishai went to the army by night. And there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment, with his spear struck in the ground at his head. And Abner and, uh, Abner and the army lay around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the, to the earth with one stroke of the spear, and I will not strike him twice. So again, Abishai is saying to David, 
Listen, here is your enemy right into your hand. He's right there. He's sleeping. Just let me take one stab at him and that's all that's needed. You'll never know what happened to him. Not so. David said to Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David would not put his circumstances ahead of God's word. So, the first question we need to ask is, does it contradict the clear command of Scripture? A modern example would be, you've been praying for a wife or a husband, and you meet someone that you have a lot in common with, the person even agrees to come to church with you. But there's one problem. The person is, uh, is an unbeliever. Should you have a romantic relationship with that person that eventually leads into marriage? After all, it seems like the Lord brought this person into your life through some unusual circumstances. It was of the Lord. No, there's clear command in Scripture that says we are not to be yoked with unbelievers. A second consideration. Will it affect other priorities in your life like church and family? You've been praying about another job and one opens up and it seems to be well suited to your skill set and it would be a career move. And your salary would increase from 20 to 25% from your current job. And it was closer to home. You interview and God gives you favor with the director and you get an offer. Well, you're looking at the guy that this happened to. There was one problem, however. You will be traveling about 20 to 30% of the time and you will be required to work longer hours. I was faced with this decision. Uh, it sure looked like a good opportunity, but I knew if I took it, it would affect other priorities in my life, like ministry and my time with my family. Uh, I could tell you how amazing the man, the, the director of the company, he drilled me on details. and. He was pushing me so hard. I thought, surely, you know, this guy, and I was very upfront with him. I, I testified to the glory of God. I said, I said, no, I'm a man, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I, and so on. And so I left there thinking, you know, I, I, that's it. This guy will never hire me. Well, he actually liked my, my forthrightness and the way I was so, and he wanted to have, to have me come and join the company. So I was faced with this decision. Uh, but I knew that, uh, as I mentioned before, that it would affect other areas. I had a good relationship with my current uh, supervisor, so I decided to talk to him. I kept getting harassed by the, by the recruiter, calling me every day. So what did you decide? What did you decide? So I didn't know. I said, all right, listen, I want to talk to my supervisor. And uh, I had a good relationship with him. I said, uh, listen, here's the situation. Uh, I just want to let you know, like, I've been offered a job, and I'm, I'm not sure what how I should go. He went and talked to the CEO of the company. The CEO called to meet with me. He offered me another position, 10 to 15 percent more than I was making, and with the opportunity to take uh, further education at company expense. I really enjoyed that position. I, I got to see a lot of facilities of the company, different facilities, and I got to witness to a lot more people. So. What seemed to be an open door was actually not the right open door, but the other one was. And so just to say, another consideration is, does it affect other priorities in your life? You should be thinking about that. Even Noah looked, I was going to supervise uh, engineers and, and Department of R&D and whatever, but that was not the Lord's will. Thirdly, does it go against biblical wisdom and godly counsel? You've been praying for a house or an apartment. You find this beautiful house or an apartment. Don't anybody take any ideas of this. I was, this has actually happened to us. You find this beautiful house or apartment and you say, Surely the Lord answered my prayer and opened the door. There's one problem. It is more than you can afford. Your monthly mortgage rent is go, or rent is going to be a large percentage of your income. 
This may require you to take a second job. Is it wise to take it? Are there biblical principles that you should be considering? Should you be consulting a financial advisor? Jesus said, Jesus said it this way. He says in, uh, in Luke chapter 14, he says, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish all, the, uh, uh, all, all who, who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Do you see the biblical principle there? Am I going to be able to meet the needs of the requirements of these monthly payments? Uh, or am I going to be a laughing stock to others? Why didn't you consider this before? Why did you, why did you step out of your ability, act uh, as it were uh, outside of your uh, comfort zone? Or I can't think of the word right now. Uh, if you have to work long hours just to pay the rent or mortgage, how will that affect your family? Do you have enough savings so that if you are sick for a couple of months and have to be out of work, you can still make the monthly payments? These are all questions that need to be asked up front. Now, you may take it and the Lord may bless you and that's great. Praise God for that. But there's no guarantee. The fourth question has to do with the pursuit of the ministry. Uh, I, I said, I don't want to take the time, but we had a situation like that. We were living in a two-bedroom bungalow uh, that we owned, and then uh, we, our family was growing, and we needed to find a larger place. Well, the uh, housing market was high at the time, and we didn't know what we could afford. So we decided to put our house on the market and see what it could bring. Well, in two weeks it sold. And it brought in 37% more than what we paid for it. And so we started looking. We didn't have a place. We moved in with my parents and waited on the Lord. A place opened up, but it was more than we wanted to pay. We could afford it, but it meant that we, had, we would have very little, if any, savings. So was it wise to make that decision? We did, I didn't know. So I sought a financial counselor who was a deacon in our previous church. And he looked at the numbers and he said to me, brother, he said, uh, you need a bigger place for your family. It's going to stretch you a little bit, but I think you could do it. I said, amen. So we moved ahead with it. Here we are uh, nine, 20 years later. So, but, but the Lord allowed me to have other jobs and more incomes. <laughs> um, the fourth has to do with uh, pursuit of the ministry. Do you have the support of the elders and the church on this decision? You've been praying about serving the Lord overseas. An opportunity opens up. But there's one problem. You don't have the support or backing of your elders and church. Should you go ahead with it? Well, if you do, you're not following the clear example that we see in Scripture. Anyone that was sent was sent by the church. So it would not be wise... To move ahead with it. What if, what if you have the church's blessing but not the financial support? Should you go ahead overseas? Well, if you're single, it's one thing, right? You can live on a lot less and maybe you have some savings. But if you're married, then you have the responsibility of, pay, of taking care of your family. And so we go back to the priorities that Pastor Joe taught. And so that needs to be taken into consideration. So... So these are things that we don't set aside because an open door seems to be open. We need to still evaluate, does it make sense? It Does it go against biblical principles? Is it wise? Uh, does it, uh, uh, is it, uh, will it affect other priorities? All those things need to be still taken into consideration and not see it as a revealed will of God. Here's your opportunity. Go ahead with it. So the next thing we want to look at is closed doors. And I think when we consider this closed doors, we need to keep this verse in mind. I read it this morning in, in our opening uh, worship. Psalm 84, 11, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. 
No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God is our sun and shield. He is our provider and protector. He has bestowed favor and honor on us through Christ. He has shown us loving kindness and mercy by pardoning our sins and adopting us into his family. Having given us his son, how will he not give us all things? He will not withhold anything that is good for us and that is for his glory. So if we being evil, he says, know how to give good gifts to our children. How much does your heavenly father give you the best gift, the Holy Spirit? He's not going to withhold anything that is good for us. He's working all things out for our good and for his glory, whether through closed doors or open doors. And so we need to keep that on the forefront of our mind as we live through lives. Otherwise, we'll be going from one disappointment to the other because you're constantly set your hope up on something and it doesn't come to fruition and your hope goes down. Just like it says, hope deferred makes a heart sad, but the desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Now, we've heard this expression say, if God closes a door, he opens a window. If God closes one door, he opens another one. Well, these are not biblical terms, but they are out there. Um, but we've all experienced closed doors. We've been praying about a particular thing, whether a job or a house or a child or, or a husband or a wife. And what seems like the right opportunity comes along, but at the end, it falls through. And there is big letdown. Now, the following points can help us better understand closed doors and lessen the disappointment. Number one, closed door could mean that it is not in God's time and you need to wait. Example from the Apostle Paul. Paul had heard of the church in Rome. He was encouraged by what he had heard of their faith and he wanted to visit them for mutual edification and to impart some spiritual gift to strengthen them. So very godly motive. He prayed for an opportunity to see them if it is in the will of God. He says in Romans 1.10, he says, Always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will, I may now at least succeed in coming to you. So it's a matter of his prayer. And he's praying, Lord, open the door for me to go to Rome. And what happens? Opportunity doesn't come. He tells them that he had often planned to go. He, makes, he even made plans. He says in verse, uh, verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented. Doors haven't been opened. In order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. The Lord finally opens the door for Paul to go, but totally not in the way that Paul had expected. He goes in as a Roman prisoner on a ship and in order on his way to appeal to Caesar uh, uh, for, for, for his case. So though Paul's desire was godly, he wanted to encourage the brethren in Rome and to be sent by them to Spain where he would further preach the gospel, where the gospel had not been preached as of yet. Uh, but he, he, uh, the opportunity wasn't there. The door did not open. Godly desire uh, with intention makes plans. Door is not there. And so he, uh, he had a plan. He, the gospel, the way he, he worked it is that he worked from Jerusalem and outward uh, to Asia Minor, to Europe. And uh, then in the finality, he was going to go to them. But he chose to go to Jerusalem first in order to deliver the funds that were collected from the brethren in, 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 uh, in uh, Europe to bring it to these poor believers in Jerusalem. So he could have gone to Rome first, but he says, no, he needs to go for wise reasons. If he had gone, 
what would become of this money? It could have been lost over so many months. Who knows? But he chose to go to Jerusalem. So all these hindrances kept him until it was in God's timing for Paul to go. So we need to ask the question. The first question is, not, not I'm sorry, not question, but we need to understand that closed door could mean, it doesn't mean that it's a locked door, it just means it's not now. Another illustration, I hope I don't bore you with these stories, but these are things kind of put, put it in perspective. Years ago, I was working at a company for a few years, and there was, didn't seem to be any opportunity for growth in that company. In the providence of God, a brother from India who was on a H-1B visa working for a large medical device company in the area, and uh, he started attending our church. Providence brought, got, brought this man out of nowhere into our church. He started attending. Well, he got his residency, and he decided he was going to move to Connecticut. So his position at the company became vacant, and he says, hey, listen, are you interested I said, sure. He took my uh, resume. He gave it to the hiring manager. Um, and uh, an interview was set up. I, I met with about six individuals, six people, and I felt God gave me favor. The, the, uh, the hiring manager uh, was familiar with the work I was doing. He worked for J&J &J prior, so he knows some of the equipment that we, that we design. And so he was very favorable, giving me tips how to interview with the others. And uh, I came away feeling very positive about the, the interview, the way it went. Uh, but for some reason, I didn't get the job. So I was, of course, disappointed, but trusted that God wants me to continue here for, for, unknow, for his, uh, his good, wise reasons. A year and a half later, the, I get a call from the hiring manager that I interviewed with at that company, he says, remember me, I am so-and-so. And he says, myself and, and the members of the team that worked on these devices are now working at another company, a Scandinavian company, and um, would you like to come and work for us? <laughs> uh, why did he keep my resume? Why did he bring my resume why did he keep it so long? Why did he bring it with him to the other company? Why did he, my, my name even came to his mind a year and a half later? Like, I don't know. Well, I got the job and wound up working for them for five years. So what I'm saying is a closed door doesn't necessarily mean uh, uh, that it's a locked door. It just means not now. So case in point, it wasn't God's will for me to work then at that company, but he opened a door at another time. Uh, secondly, closed door may be for our protection. Another example from scripture, you recall Paul had this thorn in his side and he pleaded for the Lord to take it away three times. He says he prayed in earnest, in faith for the Lord to deliver him, take him. And the Lord's response was like, no, I'm not going to do it. Because, but I'm going to give you the grace to bear under it. And but what, what, why was the throne give, the thorn given? Remember 2 Corinthians 12, 7? So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the super uh, uh, surpassing greatness of the revelation. A thorn was given to me in the flesh, flesh a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. We see here, the Lord would not hear, deliver him of this th a thorn because the Lord knew Paul's heart. He knew that if he was, didn't have this thorn, he would become puffed up and proud because of all the things he had experienced. Remember he said, I knew a man uh, uh, who was in the flesh or without, I, I do not know, in Christ, who was caught up to the third heaven. I mean, Paul saw things. He says, I can't even tell you. I can't even talk about them. And God gave him this thorn in the flesh. The Lord knows our weakness. He knows that if we get that thing that we set our hearts on, whether it be the ministry or a house or a job or, or that particular that wife or that job or that house, 
we will make an idol of it so he may keep it from us for our protection. Uh, this is beautifully in Proverbs 30. Uh, the, in the words of Augur, he says, Two things I ask of you, deny them not to me because l- before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. He says, Lord, don't make me rich. Because what the Lord says, there are few who are rich who enter the kingdom of heaven. Because why? Because they set their heart on their riches. He says, Lord, don't let me get rich because I may I may deny you. And that's sometimes the Lord keeps these things from us. Like I said, he knows our hearts. He knows what is best for us. The, the, the Lord also sees the end from the beginning. The job opportunity that you think is a good fit for you uh, and the Lord closes a door on may be taken uh, over by another company down the road and, my, and your job would be on the line. He sees what's on the other side of the door. We don't. We don't. He also knows what is in the heart of people. You meet with people, whether it's a a boss or or interview or something, or even a relationship. But you only can know what they reveal about themselves, whether it's about the company, whether about themselves. You don't know the heart of people. And so God does. So when he closes that opportunity, it's because he knows it's not for your best interest. Amen? A third reason for closed doors. Closed doors may be the Lord's redirecting us in another path. Another example from the life of Paul. Uh, The Lord closed the door for him to preach in Asia, but opened another door to Greece. Acts 16, 6 and 7, he says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, and when they had come up to, uh, to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Closed doors. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on to uh, into Macedonia concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them well you know Macedonia was Philippi well you know what happens right uh, he, he he preaches by the by the waterside and then uh, Lydia believes then the jailer and then the whole church uh, God raises up in Philippi but there was a closed doors in order to open another door so there's a redirection of course for Paul Now, what if we made a decision based on sound judgment, biblical standards, and find ourselves in trouble as a result? Should we interpret that as a confirmation that we made the wrong decision? It's a good question. Now, in some circles, they will tell you that your difficult circumstances are because of your lack of faith. God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and happy. So if you're not getting the job or, have, uh, or, be, or if you have that bad health, it must be that you be, you're doing something wrong. Kind of like Job, you know. Job, you must be doing something wrong. You lack faith. You, you, you did something. Come on, fess up. What did you do? <laughs> Nothing. So, so should we read this? If trouble comes along after we've made this decision, should we uh, read to that uh, that? that that's because we made the wrong decision. Let's see what what Peter says. 1 Peter 3.17 For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. Wait a minute. Did he really say suffer for doing good? If it be God's will? Yes, that is correct. You may face difficulty while doing the will of God. 
Listen to uh, Dave Suavely again in Decision Decisions. This is in your handout. The best decisions can be the hardest decisions. Going God's way will often lead us into risk, trouble. Even your process of decision making will not be easy. It requires the hard work of evaluating your motives, biblical study, and wisdom gained from experience. So your difficult circumstances are no indication that you made the wrong choice. Paul says, for a wide and open door, effective door has been opened to me. And there are many adversaries. So just because there are adversaries, it doesn't make this the wrong decision. God opened this door, but there are adversaries. And so you keep going. Finally, I just want to say a word about guidance and our obedience. We must bear in mind that to be guided by the Lord, we are to be living in general obedience to clear commands in the Scripture and not grieving the Holy Spirit in our lives and are seeking first the kingdom of God and not serving our own selfish ambition. As we do this, He will guide us in His way. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. And then the familiar verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 7, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. So there's trusting in the Lord, not leaning on your own understanding, acknowledging him in all your ways, and he will make your path straight. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Amen.